the Beyond Sleep Training Podcast, a podcast dedicated to sharing real tales of how people have managed sleep in their family outside of sleep training culture. Because sleep looks different with a baby in the house. And because every family is different, there is no one size fits all approach to take. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is being recorded, the Kalkadoon people. I pay my respects to the elders of this nation and the many other nations our guests reside in from the past, present and emerging. We honour Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, water and seas, as well as their rich contributions to society, including the birthing and nurturing of children. And welcome back to the Beyond Sleep Training Podcast. I'm your host, Carly Grubb. And with me today is the wonderful Victoria Angelova. I should have checked. Is it Angelova? I just realized I yeah. said your name without yeah. checking. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> and, and Victoria is one of our members of the Beyond Sleep Training Project group. And she kindly volunteered to come on the show with me today so that she can share a bit about her journey with sleep with her little family. So welcome, Victoria. Oh, thank you, Carly. Thank you. I'm I'm so honoured to be here. Wonderful. And so you're based in Sydney, currently in lockdown. Would you like to share a little bit more about you and your family before we get dive straight in? Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm based on the northern beaches of Sydney, and we are in the thick of uh, our longest stretch of lockdown. I guess uh, we're now finally <laughs> getting to feel what uh, people in Melbourne were feeling last year. Um, but um, just a bit about myself, my mum's um, Russian, my dad's Greek, so I'm a bit of a mix. Uh, if you kind of go a few generations back, there is like a bit of Finnish and a bit of uh, Serbian and a bit of Hungarian and all sorts of things. Um, but I came to Australia for work about seven years ago and I met my partner at work. Um, it was never kind of, I never planned to stay in Australia initially, but here we are <laughs> seven years later and two children later. Um, this is my home now. So, um, so yeah. Um, in terms of my family, we have, um, a two years and eight months old boy named Mick and a baby girl whose name is Maya. She's seven months old. Wonderful. And do you have any extended family around you in Australia? No, we don't. And um, yeah, we're we're a typical nuclear family. Uh, our closest relatives are about fifteen thousand kilometers away in Greece okay. and in the UK. Very much isolated, and then even more isolated by COVID. Well, I'm sure that will play part of your story. So we should probably get into it. Can you tell us before you had your first babe? Did you have any plans around sleep or babies in general? What was going on for you before he arrived? Yeah, I would probably say we were absolutely naive uh, when we thought about having a family. Me and my partner were like looking at each other with this lovey dovey look in your eyes. And you would say, Oh, you would make a great mom or you would make a great dad. But we had no idea what it actually meant. <laughs> um, and I I'm sure many people were in that kind of situation. We both come from kind of corporate finance background. So we had absolutely no idea. We were so far removed from kind of any, any experience, any real world experience with children and especially young children. Um, so we had, we really had no idea. And I remember while I was pregnant with uh, Mick, I would be going and buying all these things online and I got a cot, <laughs> the most useless object. <laughs> <laughs> as it turned out, <laughs> um, and a change table, kind of all matching design, and uh, I put them in the nursery along a rocking chair. Um, <laughs> so those three pieces of furniture I sold on Marketplace about four months later. <laughs> so, I love it that you made that call. I think it took me about two years to sell ours. I just... I don't know, I still for some reason couldn't part with these useless objects. Yeah, we just we figured out that the whole nursery essentially became just a storage space for all the baby gear, but 
there was never a baby in the nursery. <laughs> <laughs> Best laid plans, though. You had it all set up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was hilarious. And I was even, I remember like being eight months pregnant and just sitting on that rocking chair and kind of looking at the cot and imagining my baby sleeping peacefully in the cot and kind of kissing him goodnight and leaving, uh, all that stuff. It was so hilarious now that I'm looking back at it. So um, I feel like that's the perfect spot to dive on in. How did it actually go when this real baby arrived? (laughs) Yeah, that was, um, it it really took us by surprise. Um, I mean, obviously we had, we had a bit of a tough journey before we had Mick. And so we were already what I would say kind of a little bit more anxious and a little bit more stressed out than we should have been um, as, as parents, as, as new parents. Thankfully, it was before coronavirus hit. So our baby boy was born in um, just the last day of 2018. Uh, so he was a New Year's Eve baby. And my mom was able to come and help out. And she uh, was part of the birth. Um, so that was really, really wonderful. And the first few days out of hospital, I kept thinking, oh, my God, he's He's not really sleeping a lot. Like he would sleep for an hour and then he would wake up and he would feed. I didn't even know the term cluster feeding at that time, but I just knew that I was absolutely exhausted. Um, Our sleeping arrangement at the time was we had like what what they call a co-sleeping bassinet. So one of the sides of the bassinet folds down and I was pretty much having it down all the time. (laughs) um so yeah we we kind of we we realized that the only way to survive in those early days was was to pretty much have him sleep next to me and feed around the clock but at the same time I was experiencing a great deal of kind of stress and guilt and almost like fear of having him sleep next to me and uh, and I felt like It was the wrong thing to do, if that makes sense. Of course, all the advice and we, I think we took a course in the Red Nose, um, um, like training. And they did talk a lot about cold death and, you know, cold sleeping and how bad this is, et cetera, et cetera. They talked about the risks of it a lot. So... Yeah, it definitely took us a while to like to figure out what's right for us. And and part of that was we were trying to not cost sleep as much as we were cost sleeping. We were still trying to not do that. So I remember kind of even going to that infamous rocking chair and <laughs> trying to nurse him there um, in the middle of the night just so I don't fall asleep. And I ended up falling asleep. Um, and of course, as we all do, it's so hard when you have to wake up like seven, eight times a night to not be at, like to not fall asleep uh, while you're nursing. So I think what happened then was um, we hit the four month sleep progression. I mean, things were kind of going up and down and the baby days are more or less like, you know, they, they kind of roll by. But then my mom left. We had no support and the four month sleep progression hit. And oh my God, every 20 minutes, my little boy was waking me up every 20 minutes. And all he needed was just a tiny bit of boob. That's all he needed. (laughs) And he was back to sleep. Except at that time, I couldn't go back to sleep after he woke me up. And that kept happening for several weeks. And I thought, oh, how come am I not able to go back to sleep after he's, you know, peacefully sleeping next to me? So we went to the GP. The GP said, well, maybe you're a bit anxious and gave me some sleeping pills. Then we went to the GP again several weeks later saying, well, sleeping pills are working, but I still can't fall asleep without them. And I don't really know what's wrong, but something's wrong. And um, the GP gave me some more sleeping pills, <laughs> stronger ones, and sent me back home again. Um, long story short, we ended up talking to our early childhood nurse who pretty much said, well, maybe it's your baby that's keeping you awake. 
even though I said several times, well, my baby's falling asleep and I'm awake. Like, it's not my baby keeping me awake. It's probably something else. Oh, well, maybe you're anxious. Maybe this, maybe that. Long story short, we ended up in Tresillion. And uh, that was a very low point in my life. Um, He was four months. He just turned four months. And I was absolutely at my wit's end. I haven't slept, like literally haven't slept for over a week. So my whole body was shaking. Every single cell in my body was aching me. And I was feeling like an utter failure. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I had no idea what else and what more I could do to help this guy sleep or help myself sleep for that matter. Yeah. Um, so we, we went to Tresillion and, um, at that time I also had this massive oversupply of milk. So the nurses kept saying, oh, you're feeding him too much. That's why you have the oversupply. So they tried to kind of put him on this feeding routine of four hours, which he hated. (laughs) Uh, He's like, no, mommy, I want to eat when I'm hungry. I don't want to eat every four hours. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So your unsettled baba. Oh, wow. Yep. That sounds like a, a recipe for disaster. Yeah, so so that was that was five days during which the nurses were pretty much well, they were trying to help us move him onto the feed, play, sleep routine, which um which I don't think my baby was into that routine anyway. And I, I, I'm not sure any baby is into that routine, but uh, he definitely didn't like it. And then they tried to convince me that a 40 minute nap was not a restful nap. And so every time he had a 40, because he was having 40 minute naps. Um, and every time he did have a 40 minute nap, there was this nurse and I still remember her face. She was like so vigorously shaking the bassinet, trying to get him to sleep. And, and my, my little boy was just looking at her with amusement in his eyes, <laughs> thinking, why are you shaking me? And what, what are you doing? And you, and you look a bit funny. <laughs> and he was just like, he was almost like having fun because I could see him smiling. And I, I was looking was okay. at him from, from yeah, he thought he, he thought it was something funny. So I was looking like through her shoulder and he was just doing it like so vigorously. And she looked at me and she's like, I would do this for one hour, even if, I have to just to get him to sleep for 10 extra minutes. And I looked at her like, oh, my God, I could never do that. But why? Your wide awake baby who's clearly rested because he's just chilling out watching her going, what on earth? But she had had it in her head. Yeah, and I don't know, for some reason, you know, I – they convinced me. I was was totally convinced that 40 minutes is not enough. I mean, looking back now – after having my second one, who sometimes sleeps 10 minutes and she's happy, um, I'm, I'm looking and thinking, oh, my God, like, why would we dictate to our babies how long well to sleep for? Um, but at that point in time, I don't know. It's probably as a young mom, you, you just want to have a recipe. And this is, this is probably our desire to just kind of have a bit of predictability and certainty and say, oh, if you do this one, two, three, four things in this precise order, this is what's going to be the outcome and your baby's going to sleep fine and they're going to develop fine. And, you know, you you just kind of, you want predictability as a young mother. And I think this is what the, the, the medical industry and the sleep industry are essentially preying on, if that's the right word to use. They are, or exploiting in a way, they are exploiting this need for young mothers or young families to have a sense of safety and security. And that's because we're alone, we're a young family, it's just the two of us, we never had a baby, and all of a sudden we're just trying to figure it out. And probably many of us have had a career or have been at work in a professional setting, and we know that if you do things in a certain way, then you can you can expect a certain outcome and that goes like that that's just such a normal thing that we do at work and we're getting so good at it 
that once you have a baby, you immediately feel compelled to kind of apply the same method and say, okay, well, if I follow the recipe, I'm going to get a perfectly baked muffin, right? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. It's the control, isn't it? Like being able to control the outcome of a situation. Exactly, exactly. To how you you imagined it. Because that's so much of it, isn't it? How you imagine how it should be. And that's right telling you you just need to do xyz and you can have that well of course you're going to try of course yeah yeah of course and also like but people should understand that their imagination is a product of society's kind of preconceived ideas that are presented in all sorts of kind of ways throughout our journey as people right so I, I don't know. I never even questioned sleep before I had children. I never doubted sleep. It wasn't even a thought that sleep would be an issue. And all of a sudden, it took me by surprise that it was an issue. So anyway, after that stay in Trusillium, um, we, we didn't get anywhere. Our baby wasn't sleeping any longer than 40 minutes during the day. And at night, he was sleeping just as much as he did before Trusillium. Except now we were left with this advice of having to follow that feed, play, sleep routine, which kind of didn't work. So the only good thing that happened in Tresillian is that I got seen by a GP there. And she was the first person who kind of said, "Um, maybe you should check your thyroid because your lack of sleep and your weight loss is worrying me a little bit. And thank God God she did that because... um, they found out that my thyroid was severely overactive and that's essentially what was keeping me awake. It had nothing to do with my bug. Um, I had hit what is known to be um, postpartum thyroiditis, but mine one was going severely overactive instead of underactive. It's just how my body reacted to the disease, I guess. So anyway, we ended up seeing a specialist and another doctor and another specialist. And um, the advice that I was given then was was kind of pretty bad. They basically said, well, we can prescribe you medication only if you're prepared to wean. Uh, because, Because the meds that we can give for your condition are not compatible with breastfeeding. And unless you're, you know, unless you're prepared to wean your bub, and of course, I wasn't prepared to wean my bum. <laughs> um, then all we can do is just give you some like mild anti-anxiety medication that could potentially help you sleep. So here we were. We knew what the disease was, but for some reason, they didn't give me any meds to treat the condition. And so I ended up in what ended up after three months being like a three months of solid sleep deprivation. That had nothing to do with baby. my baby. With my baby, yeah. <sighs> um, Even though your baby was a frequent waker, like you said, there was still plenty of sleep going on between those wakes. Well, so yeah. Baby, if, when, what, when they told you that the medication wasn't compatible with, with breastfeeding, did they suggest that, that you might want to check that with someone who was a breastfeeding and medication specialist or anything like that? Because so often I remember when I had my third baby, I ended up in hospital with appendicitis and I was told to do the whole pump and dump thing um, for some of the medication I was on. But I knew there was a guy called Rodney White down in in Melbourne who is a pharmacist who specializes in breastfeeding and medication. And so um, I emailed him immediately. I'm like, this is what they want to give me. Can I I feed? Do I need to pump and dump? What's the go? Because my baby was 10 days old. And I got almost... Yeah, and I got almost an immediate response back to confirm that it was actually safe and not to pump and dump. And so it drives me wild. Like I want to know because I know there are some medication that isn't safe, but I wonder if the people actually knew for sure or if they were just doing the whole overly cautious thing. Yeah, I think as it turned out, um, I mean, now that I know and this time I had the same condition after my second bob, but this time it got treated. I think what, what happened the first time around is the specialist who I saw, um, 
didn't know enough about this condition because it's a very rare presentation of a common disease. So for all I know, she probably thought that my symptoms of lack of sleep could have been kind of caused by anxiety or depression. She thought that. And hence, she didn't, she didn't really think that it was safe to give me antithyroid medication, which was essentially what I had to take. Um, which, by the way, is safe for breastfeeding, as, as it turned out, and I was taking it. Um, but so you're yeah, it is what it is. I mean, yeah, the advice that I was given at the time, and of course, like you, you don't know anything better. You going there. I was already so sleep deprived. I couldn't even think clearly. I'm standing Absolutely. in front of this person who's speaking to me from a point of authority, and she's saying, "Well, unless you're prepared to win, this is what I can give you, and um, take this anti-anxiety medication, and off you go." Oh, and she sent me back home and said, "Have some milk and Milo at home." <laughs> um, oh, we see, don't you? Like, it's this whole. If people are listening at home. And you are or find yourself in a position where you're being declined medication because you're a breastfeeding parent, please know that there are services out there that can confirm whether or not that medication is safe for you because a lot of providers don't actually know on that level whether it's safe 100%. or not. And so they go with the route of saying it's not safe just to cover all bases. But all that's really doing is putting you in a precarious position and your baby unnecessarily when there are like there's LactMed and there's, I uh, know there's Dr. Rodney White down in at Monash in Melbourne. Um, and there's, oh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Mother oh, Safe. There is a, mother there is a, safe. yeah, exactly. There's a service called, and I found it later, much later. There's a service for, um, People in Sydney or in New South Wales, I believe, uh, and it's a phone number. Um, we might just have to find it and kind of pop it into. Um, yeah, I'll put it in the show into, notes. Exactly. Um, and you can call anytime and they will be able to give you advice about safety or medication. So important because it's it's it matters. It really does. Like not being able to take a medication that you require because of someone's misunderstanding about it's indication yeah. to go with breastfeeding or yeah. not is, is dangerous. So I'm really pleased that for your second baby they worked it out. But thank you for sharing that with us because I feel like that might help some other people who are listening along at home too. Yeah, um, 100%. Just, I'm just looking at our time and I feel like we're going to have to do a second episode with you. Would that be okay, Victoria? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we're only just beginning to get started. Um, but before we finish up this episode, would you be able to share what's a tip you'd like to pass on to people listening along at home? You literally just took the thoughts out of my mind. I was about to say, um, for all the mums out there, if you feel like something is wrong with your body, just go and try to find out what the cause is. And if, if you feel that what's told to you and what's given to you as a diagnosis does not necessarily fit with how you feel, just go and advocate for yourself. Um, I mean, during that period of time, I was told by a number of medical professionals, including psychiatrists, including GPs, including specialists, that I have depression and anxiety. It turned out that it wasn't that and treatment with anti-anxiety medications didn't help. It was simply, it was simply not helpful. So if you feel like something's wrong, you're probably right. You know your body better than any doctor does. Just go and fight for your, pretty much for your right to get to the right diagnosis. Absolutely. And I think that's one thing we need to be careful of when it comes to, um, when a parent is reporting not feeling right, not assuming that it's a mental health concern because as common as mental health illnesses and whatnot can be a part of postpartum for many people, it can also be masking or being used as a mask by professionals if that's the only layer that they look at the person across. And so I feel like listening to your story, you very clearly were identifying the issue was with you and not with your baby or how you were very clear-minded about that the whole way. Absolutely. We ended up in ER. We were so sleep deprived. We ended up in the emergency and I looked at the people who assessed me there and I said, guys, I am not able to sleep. I am shaking. 
my heart is racing. This is not my baby keeping me awake. And they, they kept telling me, but you're probably just anxious as a new mother. And so please, if you feel like something's not right with your body, it probably isn't. You know your body better than anybody else. Just go for it and try, try to kind of find the real cause of what's wrong. And that might mean going to a number of care providers. I'm really yeah. sorry that that was your story. But also, hopefully, we do have health professionals who listen along to the podcast. And this might be something that they take on board professionally as well to make sure that the that you do scratch the surface when someone's presenting, especially frequently. You presented on many occasions. That's yep. got to be taken seriously, whether they whether you believe that it is just depression and anxiety or not, you still owe it to the person to do further investigation, especially when somebody is telling you that there's more to the story. So thank you so much for sharing that, Victoria. That was a fantastic first episode with you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the second part of of your story. Are you able to stick around with me and we'll do a bit more recording now? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks to everybody listening along. If you're enjoying the show, please make sure you drop us a review. It really helps with that distribution. And also you can join us on Facebook and on Instagram where we love to have conversations about things that are going on in each of our episodes and we'd love to chat with you. So thanks again, Victoria. Thank you. Thanks, Carly. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. The information we discussed was just that, information only. It is not specific advice. If you take any action following something you've heard from our show today, it is important to make sure you get professional advice about your unique situation before you proceed, whether that advice be legal, financial, accounting, medical, or any other advice. Please reach out to me if you do have any questions or if there's a topic you'd really like us to be covering. And if you know somebody who'd really benefit from listening to our podcast, please be sure to pass our name along. Also check out our free peer support group, the Beyond Sleep Training Project and our wonderful website, www.littlesparklers.org. If you'd like even more from the show, you can join us as a patron on Patreon and you can find a link for that in our show notes. If listening is not really your jam, we also make sure we put full episode transcripts on our Little Sparklers website for you to also enjoy and fully captioned YouTube videos as well on our Little Sparklers channel. So thanks again for listening today. We really enjoy bringing this.